Deputy Director for Waterfront Planning from the Boston <coughs> Development Authority. Um, I want to offer our thanks to the New England Aquarium and Bud Riss and his team for hosting us. He spoils us with a great venue like this, uh, but we thought it would be a great location to kick off our planning effort. Um, in 2009, Mayor Menino directed the BRA to initiate a comprehensive planning process to take advantage of the unique opportunity brought by the depression of the Central Lottery uh, and the Central Lottery Project for the City of Boston and to reconnect the downtown neighborhoods to the water and provide residents of the city a dynamic new public space that hosts a diverse array of uses. The Mayor also wanted to make sure that the future developments along the Greenway edges were consistent with the city's grand vision for a revitalized waterfront um, in downtown. Following an 18-month planning process, the BRA adopted the Greenway District Use and Development Guidelines in August of 2010. Uh, the guidelines establish a set of use and development controls um, for parcels adjacent to the Greenway. The guidelines also aim to preserve the newly created open space and activate the public space in and around the Greenway parks. And finally, finally, they also ensure the long-term value of the public's investment in the Greenway and balances the development pressures in the Greenway District with the other development opportunities in the downtown and city as a whole. The product of this upcoming pro process um, is to create new zoning for the Greenway District to really codify the planning guidelines and the mission of the guidelines. Um, so that's the zoning, a new green, greenway zoning. Um, some of the things that we'll be looking at is an analysis of the existing zoning and making recommendation for you know, what type of zoning we utilize for this process. Uh, we'll also be conducting a, a waterfront uh, municipal harbor planning process that I'll give a little bit of detail to in a couple minutes. And the final product is a, fu a public realm and watershed activation plan uh, comparable to the Four Point Channel Watershed Activation Plan, a master plan for the waterfront. All of this, um, all of these products, these three um, products, will be based upon the Greenway District guidelines. The Greenway District, as is shown in this image above, um, it connects Chinatown all the way to the Bullfinch Triangle. It touches multiple neighborhoods in the city. It, it's adjacent to the waterfront, the Four Point Channel. Uh, the financial district. The zoning for this area is very complex. Um, the Greenway itself has its own zoning, Article 49, but that zoning doesn't relate to any of the adjacent parcels. Uh, there's no communication between the two. And if you look at this map, you'll see various um, neighborhood districts, the Northern Neighborhood District, Harbor Park Neighborhood District, uh, Leather District, there are all these different um, zones that really need to be harmonized um, to relate to the guidelines, and that's what we intend to do. Uh, this shows you the district and all the neighborhoods that it touches and affects, and all these neighborhoods have different context, um, heights, um, urban context, open space, so those are other things that need to be considered as we move along. Uh, to add to the complexity and the confusion is Chapter 91. Um, it's a, a state program that protects and promotes waterfront uses, water-related uses, maritime uses. For us, it's like another form of zoning. It's applied statewide, and it regulates height, setback, use, law coverage. And to um, harmonize our proposed new zoning with Chapter 91, that's done through a municipal harbor planning process, which we'll be conducting um, in the next several months. Um, we'll also be looking at the specific downtown waterfront. This is vintage waterfront. It was the city's first attempt to connect people down to the waterfront underneath the Central Lottery Highway. Um, our first attempts at public access and uh, establishing residences and cultural uses on the waterfront. Um, so it's, it's, it's rather old and it needs some nuances and updates and that's what we'd like to um, work with the community on is getting ideas on how to kind of upgrade, overhaul this waterfront. Um, I promise you by the end of this planning process you will not be confused about zoning or Chapter 91. That, that's our goal, is to make this a very um, understandable uh, planning process. Um, the planning process, um, as part of the waterfront activation plan, master plan, 
expands the Greenway scope to develop a plan and vision for the downtown water's edge, comparable to the Four Point Channel Watershed Activation Plan, including Harbor Walk, promotion of maritime uses, activation of building edge edges, connections to the Greenway, and the long-term expansion and success of cultural anchors, including the New England Aquarium and the Boston Harbor um, Islands National Park area. I'm pleased to uh, introduce Peter Mead, the director of the BRA, who's going to speak a little bit more about the mayor's objectives uh, for this planning process and our shared goals to promote the Greenway and access to Boston Harbor. Rich counted on applause through the whole time here. <laughs> um, just as I was looking at the slides when I came in, uh, I saw this one, and it reminded me, Judge Paul Garrity, the Massachusetts judge who heard uh, the Quincy case uh, about Boston Harbor, uh, long after he was sitting on the bench, I asked him how it happened that the harbor got so dirty. So how, how was it so bad? And he said the harbor didn't have advocates. And if you look at this picture, you can understand why the harbor lacked uh, advocates. I mean, it was almost walled off. I mean, a, gr a way to create no advocates is create no access. And, and, and in a way, uh, more than a century ago, that's what happened in our city. And I think what we have an opportunity to do here is to really change things in a dramatic way. Things have gotten so much better. And as you look at the slides, you can look at in the last couple of decades what has happened we have uh, turned down the central artery, created the Greenway, the harbor is clean, the access to these great harbor islands are all part of what we're doing. And the legacy we leave as a generation uh, about the harbor and what is here is an important part of our legacy. And it's part of what Mayor Menino has talked to all of us in the BRA about. We do have some fairly lofty goals. The notion that no one would be confused about Chapter 91 at the end of this process means a fantastic education is going to take place or will be a century in the planning process, one or, one or the other. But we do want people to understand the mix as Rich went through this. And it's very important to do that. So we're doing a couple of things. Uh, one thing we're not doing. Somebody said to me, so what's the zoning? And my answer was, you tell me. And we really do want to go through a process where together we, 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 we work this through to understand what's the best thing for our, for our community about this. That's really what this is about. We're doing a couple of things that uh, are important to note. We're doing some walking tours tomorrow the 14th, a charrette on Friday the 15th uh, at the Boston Harbor Hotel. And we want to get more public input. And we'll be looking for public input as we go through this process. So. Thank you for being here tonight at the beginning, and you, hopefully people walk out of here tonight with an idea of what we're attempting to do and how we're going to get that done. But that will only work if you participate in all of this. Uh, and I think for all of us, we could take pride a as we look at, and, and as you look around this room, you see people who have worked on the harbor, the harbor islands, the greenway, the depression of the art, all, you know, folks who live here, this is what we want to do. I don't want to stop the process of, if there's a development that can work and be an, access, uh, an, uh, an asset to us, I don't want to stop that. But I do want to make sure that we take a look at the large picture here and how we make things better and how, frankly, we can be proud of what we do. So thanks for being here. Thanks for the work you're going to do in the future. And I think we'll all find a process that works for us. Thanks very much. as we begin our planning efforts, it's important to look back at the evolution of the city and its connection to the waterfront. Um, I would like to introduce Kara Shen, Chief Planner for the Boston Redevelopment Authority, to walk us through a little bit about the city's evolution and its historic connection to Boston Harbor. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, I'm not going to take up the rest of the evening, evening talking about the history of planning of the waterfront. But I thought I would um, 
really try to put into context the task, the planning task that's at hand. And so really, it really is about the next transformative uh, act that we are, uh, are uh, in, uh, embarking on for the downtown waterfront. <coughs> Um, and I would say that the, the physical character of the downtown waterfront really does emb embody the values of our city, our citizens, and, and embodies our mindset and attitude towards the harbor. So instead of going through literally the, um, the, the, the history, I want to show a series of, of uh, time-lapse photographs of our downtown that should explain um, what I think the transformation we've been through essentially in the last century. So this is from the 1920s, where, where Boston was still an industrial and working waterfront. And then, of course, in the 1950s, uh, with the depopulation of uh, post-war America and, and, of course, Massachusetts, came the, uh, the building of the highway, the first central artery that actually defined for a whole generation our relationship to the water, which is cutting off the immediate downtown uh, from, the, from the waterfront. And then, of course, um, this is a little later in the 90s, but it, it, it effectively um, shows the, the, the transformation through the 60s, which was the urban renewal of, of government center. Uh, in the, and then, of course, the first um, reclamation towards the water with the, with the aquarium's first building in 1969, the Harbor Towers in 1970. Um, and of course, Quincy Market and the Walk to the Sea, Richard has already mentioned the desire to connect the downtown underneath the elevated highway to the waterfront. And then in the 80s, of course, began the cleanup of the harbor that, that Peter has already mentioned, um, essentially really making what was not a recreation and an asset to the city, reclaiming that. And now we $4 billion later, in 20 years, we have a waterfront that we can almost in, uh, well, in the downtown, maybe not quite swimming, but certainly the, the, the beaches of the city we can. Um, and then, of course, in the 80s also began the planning of the Big Dig, which is uh, taking down the barrier to the water. Um, and you can begin to see also in the 60s and 70s the construction of the, the parking garages, that once you created all this highway, you had to build garages to, where people can store their cars and get to work. Here's the construction of the, the highway uh, during the 90s. Um, and of course, the collective effort between us and the state to create a governance and, and entity to actually take on the role of actually managing this new asset, which eventually became the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And this is really the most recent kind of uh, envisioning of the downtown. And then, of course, more recently, this whole effort of the last 20, 30 years of really connecting the city back to the harbor, and now with Sandy, our reassessment of what that connection really means. Um, so, you know, now that we have, we have, we've got better connection, we now need to protect ourselves uh, from a changing climate and a rising sea level and the challenge that comes with that. Now, <coughs> I, don't, I think you should all draw your own conclusion on the slides of the kinds of transformations that have occurred in the last century of the downtown. I think there are a few um, um, themes. First, that essentially Boston's downtown since the 50s certainly was a laboratory of planning ideas and urban design ideas. Not all of them were successful, but they were powerful ideas. And they were powerful ideas that drove change. The second thing is that I think the resili resiliency and the adaptability of the physical structure of our city is, is intact. Um, and then third is that there were bureaucrats like me and Rich in their days that were devising regulations that governed and managed the growth and change. But I would say that there was no a priori idea of what the perfect regulations actually were any that, uh, during the, any of those times, or for us right now, what would be the perfect regulations for us? Rich has already outlined the fact that we would be doing zoning. But I think that the, the challenge for us and the goal is to create regulations that embody the, the values of our city, that builds on the DNA that has made Boston really one of the great cities in the world, um, and that it has to be aspirational. So I think that with your help 
and your participation, we can get there. And I hope that we won't bore you along the way with the mechanics of the regulations, but that you help us stay above the fray and really think about what our aspirations are for the waterfront and how we can create the, the regulations and the bureaucracy that ultimately can actually take us to where we need to go. So I hope that is, it is an editorialized history. Um, I, I hope there are people in the audience who were part of that. I know Sai is probably somewhere here and saying how I've, I've probably rewritten history tonight, and I apologize if I did that. But, but I hope that we all take that, take these grand ideas that we've, we've actually been able to execute in the last 50 years and stay aspirational for our coming tasks at hand. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kairos. There are many planning layers, land use controls, and policy objectives that apply and inform the downtown waterfront. Um, these we intend to remain in effect, but also inform us as we begin this planning process. Uh, Chris Bush, who's a senior waterfront planner from the BR BRA and I, are going to go through several of these planning efforts um, just to remind you that there, there are broader systems that connect the waterfront to other neighborhoods. Um, this is a, a montage of the various plans. Uh, that impact the downtown waterfront, and they date from the 1960s, the Urban Renewal Plan, up until uh, 2010, when the Greenwood District guidelines were put into place. Um, connectivity, you know, getting people to and along the waterfront, um, is a primary goal of our, um, our waterfront planning. And Harbor Walk is the central uh, kind of program for our waterfront um, planning in the city. Uh, there's 70, uh, 47 miles of shoreline in Boston Harbor, and about 38 miles of that are open for public access, which is dramatic because in the 1960s it really was just the downtown waterfront with the urban renewal plan and then eventually it grew to uh, the Charlestown Navy Yard and then beyond. In the downtown waterfront, uh, most of the area is open for public access, but you know, like I said, it's vintage. There are areas where ADA access isn't, isn't available, uh, where there's still a sense of privatization <coughs> or not much activity that really wouldn't attract you that way. Another thing that we want to do through our wayfinding um, and just certain kind of areas of the downtown waterfront is to let you know that you're part of a broader system, that when you're on Harbor Walk, you know you're part of this 47 miles of uh, sapphire necklace, as we call it. So that's an important component. Uh, another kind of central program for our waterfront uh, uh, planning is uh, water transportation. The downtown waterfront is the hub of water transportation and in inner harbor and outer harbor service. Uh, we think there's unlimited potential to expand ferry systems in Boston Harbor and to address um, the near capacity highways and the getting to capacity uh, land-based uh, public transportation systems. With respect to <coughs> landside connections, uh, the Crossroads Initiative uh, has been in place since 2004. Um, this has really looked at 12 <coughs> primary thoroughfares in the city, looking at ways to enhance their capacity to uh, connect uh, districts within the city as well as the downtown areas to the uh, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy Greenway, as well as the, uh, the waterfront. Uh, the primary uh, design parameters of, of this effort are to uh, enhance safety, multimodal capacity, as well as environmental quality and the economic vitality of these uh, these throughways. Um, as you can see, Oliver, Broad, and State Street fall within the planning area. Uh, at this time, work is proceeding on Broad with uh, several amenities already in place, uh, new pavers, uh, uh, bike lanes will be going in, as well as benches and street trees. Uh, work in this area should be done by the end of this year, and uh, future years we'll see work on Oliver and State Street. Here we have the, uh, the downtown waterfront Faneuil Hall uh, Festival Marketplace, which is uh, developed as part of the, uh, the Urban Renewal Program. Uh, just a huge uh, visitor draw that, that also uh, conducts people down to the city's uh, waterfront. Um, through this planning uh, program, we'll look to uh, build upon these connections. Um, there are also uh, several planning, prior planning efforts specific to uh, uh, Long Wharf. Um, this is a, a true uh, landmark, actually a registered uh, historic landmark, um, the city's oldest continually operated wharf 
in the United States. Um, the first master plan developed in the early 80s looked to uh, rehabilitate this, uh, this wharf, um, reconstructing its granite seawalls and bulkheads, as well as establishing the first public plazas, walkways, as well as uh, waterside transit facilities. Um, in 2007, the VRA looked to capitalize upon um, the, uh, the historic aspects of this wharf, developing uh, an interpretive plan, ways to uh, better connect the wharf uh, to a, its uh, historic resources to the West Faneuil Hall, the Old State House, Customs House Tower, um, also building on several uh, historic themes such as the uh, 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 the North End uh, fishermen who uh, were residents on the north side of the wharf for many years, the wharfing out of the downtown area, as well as the disembarkation of the, the British. Um, this is a plan that's, that's in work right now. Um, there, there are several elements of this that can be incorporated into um, the, uh, the new planning effort. This is a, a rendering of that interpretive plan. I can serve as an example to future interpretive uh, signage uh, along the downtown waterfront. Another component um, that we'll introduce to this planning process is the rehabilitation of the Northern Avenue Bridge. Uh, the bridge will be raised with an S, not a Z. Uh, it'll be preserved. It'll be elevated and, and not uh, utilized in a swing fashion. Uh, we think it's an important connection both to the South Boston waterfront and back to uh, the Greenway District. Um, it will handle uh, vehicular use to address capacities in both neighborhoods, but also maintain its harbor walk access on the outer barrel. Um, we believe it's an opportunity to address some of the access issues behind the Coast Guard building. Right now there's a set of staircases that bring you down to um, Harbor Walk and uh, we'd like to put in ramps and other things. Um, this is a five-year uh, planning process to design the bridge, get the level of funding, and implement it. By elevating it, we'll be able to get continuous water transportation into the channel, into the terminal that's going to be built at Atlantic Wharf. Some other um, important public facilities uh, that we want to recognize is uh, the New England Aquarium and also some of the newer facilities. Uh, this is the Boston Society of Architecture space at Atlantic Wharf. It's a public facility that was introduced through a municipal harbor plan uh, to make sure the building remained public and inviting. Some of the urban edges and harbor connections were based out of the Boston 2000 plan. This was the original vision, the 1997 master plan for the central artery before the construction embarked and provides a lot of the recommendations that were built into the um, Greenway District vision. Um, I referenced the Four Point Channel Watersheet Activation Plan, which we completed in 2002. And, and it was a first of its kind where we actually master planned the water, where we came up with a program or a, a menu of uses to get people down to the water, onto the water. Instead of having each development propose a water taxi stop, we looked at what suited the neighborhood on both sides, on the South Boston side and the downtown side. We built consensus and provided great guidelines for developers as they were going through their permitting so that we already had an idea of what we wanted to see for public benefits. Um, so we'd like to kind of use this as a model for what we'd like to do along the downtown water's edge is just create this menu of public benefits, um, improving water transportation, programming, marinas, and other uses. There are over 32 Boston Harbor Islands, um, and the gateway to the islands are through the Greenway, the uh, Boston Harbor Pavilion, and Long Wharf North, which serves as the um, ferry <coughs> connection to those islands. I think one of our challenges is to, to get more repeat visitors, not people just going out to the islands one time, and that's it, to create that seamless transition between the open <coughs> spaces of the Greenway the Emerald Necklace, and the Harbor Islands. And, and we'd like to build on that uh, through this planning process. Some of the regulatory and performance standards I've already gone over. Um, there was a municipal harbor plan that uh, was laid over this area in 1990 that um, resulted into the Harbor Park uh, District, um, zoning district, uh, which provides some development guidelines for this area. Um, Another thing that the city's made advancement of since the Greenway District was uh, implemented was to address climate change, and particularly for this area, sea level rise. Um, we know the area is prone to flooding. These are some of the <coughs> images from Hurricane Sandy. 
And what we'd, lead, we'd like to do is continue the discussion on making sure that this area is resilient to flooding. You know, we're not going to be able to move buildings, elevate existing buildings. We want to make sure that after high water and flooding, that they can maintain their functions, that people can remain living here the day after high water, and that new developments uh, protect themselves from high water, but also introduce changes to protect, to protect infrastructure. Another impo uh, important component is Article uh, 37, our green building uh, requirement. Uh, this is an image of Atlantic Wharf, which is LEED Platinum. And when we were first introducing this uh, new green building zoning, um, a, a lot of people just didn't think it would work, that it was impossible to achieve. Um, and now most of our uh, new developments are, are getting to that platinum standard. This is just a montage of all the different plans that we've gone over, a compendium of those plans. And again, we're going to continue to remind you that they exist, they'll inform us through the workshops and through the, the planning process ahead of us in the next couple of months. Um, we're fortunate to have a consulting uh, services um, team, a, dy a dynamic team uh, that's going to guide and advise us through this planning process. Uh, the core team includes UTIL and a Durand and Nastis, uh, but also offers disciplines in zoning, water transportation, climate change, and sea level rise. Uh, Matthew Littell of UTIL and Tom Skinner uh, will lead this team. Uh, Matthew, you may recall, uh, was the team leader for the Greenway District planning process, and um, he's going to give us an overview of the Greenway District planning study, the master plan that we want to codify through this upcoming process. Um, and then after, after his presentation, we're just going to open it up uh, Q&A, questions and answers. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Rich. Um, I think as Rich mentioned, the important point is that the process we're about to embark on right now begins with the Greenway Guidelines. And to that end, I'm going to back up a little bit, talk about uh, the sort of thinking that went into the Greenway Guidelines, some of the methodology that we used um, to create them, and to explain how those particular guidelines, and particularly the Wharf District, uh, might launch us into our next phase here. Um, the, the, most of us remember the time when the expressway was really like a kind of uh, a, a choker collar. I like to call it, it's just what this image seems to describe, around the downtown. And it literally divided the downtown from the waterfront. And it's very fitting that, that our new focus on the waterfront, particularly its accessibility, begins with the Greenway Guidelines, which um, really dealt with the aftermath of the suppression of the artery. Um, at the time that the artery was being suppressed, I think there was so much interest in what was going to go in its place that uh, perhaps there was less attention given to uh, what would happen along the remaining edges. Um, and even in very early visions about removing the artery, um, very little attention was paid to what would happen on those, those now scarred edges. Um, well, it's done, and um, I think a lot of those, those edges are now more visible than we even thought. Um, a lot of them we call scarred edges, buildings that were literally chopped off to the original expressway, um, unresolved backs that have now become fronts, um, and then a different kind of damage that was done, buildings built after the elevated uh, highway was put into place where uh, <clears throat> literally building backs were put onto the, the, the central expressway. Um, here's, a, here's a back that would never be a back today. Uh, but interesting, there is not a good entrance along this, this edge. Um, there are many buildings that have begun to repair. Um, the, the building you see on the right and, and the, the wharf building in the middle has also begun to open itself up to the Greenway. Um, there are other buildings that, uh, like two, I think this is 255 State, uh, that were renovated in anticipation and began to put active uses along those edges. Um, there are still challenges that remain. Um, garage uses are particularly persistent, A, because people need to park, uh, and B, uh, it's hard to come by parking spaces. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we will continue to address. Um, a, a great example, I think, of these new pressures actually 
coming to fruit. The, the old Dainty Dot building, uh, now demolished, but um, at first a victim of the original artery was chopped off, and now, in a way, a kind of victim of improving circumstances where um, much bigger, higher, better uses um, are overtaking some of these, these older uses now that these edges are so attractive. Um, this is the sort of context, really, of the, of the planning, of the Greenway guideline process was <clears throat> how can these uh, edges, what should these edges be like, uh, and what should the development along its edges be such that we can maximize the synergies between these new valuable open spaces and the, the new possible active uses that are along its edges? What's the right balance? Um, we developed a kind of what we call the four-legged stool that looked at this problem from various angles, uh, including environmental issues, economics, urban design and form, um, and program and use. Uh, we began by uh, doing a series of test fits, sort of hypothetical development scenarios on parcels that we thought uh, may experience some possible development over the next 10 or 15 years. Um, and then doubled back and sort of evaluated those scenarios based on a sort of four or like a stool or a four lens camera, if you will. Um, the area was selected based on the parcel's ability to impact the greenway. And we identified several kinds of um, developable or improvable conditions um, that included, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, garage sites, uh, inactive edges, um, vacant sites, um, and um, and backs, backs that had been turned to front or sort of chopped off conditions, if you will, or scarred edges. Um, and, and we looked at these, particularly, uh, it became quickly apparent that the Greenway was not one district, but many, um, with, with many sort of sub-characters. Um, and as we refined our, uh, our areas, we sort of sharpen the, the pencil on where these districts were and what the sort of character lines were. Um, as we look through program and use, um, we, we <coughs> tried to do a sort of big picture tally of what total potential development might be in this district. Um, we started, you know, the existing in this area is about 22 million square feet. With a sort of lower rise scenario, we were experiencing increases of about 2 million. In the most aggressive scenario we could imagine, um, we were netting about 3 million square feet. And the punchline really was that even if we were to push development as hard as we could, um, the actual number of bodies that this would contribute to the area was really not that significant. Um, and that if we were to try and activate this area, we can't simply throw floor area at it. We need to find ways of making destinations, improving accessibility, uh, finding ways to make it easier and more attractive for all the people in the downtown and abutting neighborhoods to get here. Um, but there's a more nuanced series of relationships that need to take place. We looked at the environment. Uh, we looked at the wind. Uh, we did wind modeling, which turned out to be less of a factor uh, than <coughs> solar shading, which heavily influenced um, our decisions about where density should be along the Greenway. There are multiple conditions. Uh, the Greenway curves, the sun moves, um, and <coughs> it's a complex problem. But we tested high and low scenarios at different times of day and different times of the year and tried to track where <coughs> new shadows might be created uh, and for how long during the day. So this is a kind of an intensity thermometer. Um, essentially, the, the, the darker the red, uh, the, more, the more intensity you have in terms of shadow. Uh, we looked also at um, what was allowed as of right. Currently, what would the impact of the new different scenarios be? Um, in short, these affected heavily um, our decisions about allowable heights and so forth. Um, what we have in front of us, I think, is to focus uh, maybe less specifically on the greenway itself now. I think we turn our attention really to the shadows on the water itself and also the 
the accessible areas that abut the water, um, which you'll see is depicted here in that sort of blue. Um, the economic analysis was actually quite complex. Um, our consultants, HRNA, tried to model the, the kind of economic improvement that the artery had provided, that the, uh, the Greenway had provided, um, and tried to help us understand what the right balance is between development um, pressures and the need to preserve this valuable new open space. Um, the long and the short of it is that uh, we believe that the transformation of value actually takes a long time. Um, there are a few salient examples, the, the west side waterfront in Manhattan, uh, which I think this scenario that you're seeing here actually probably took a lot longer than 13 years, uh, and Embarcadero in San Francisco, which um, was a kind of forced situation, uh, but uh, has taken quite a while and some would say is still evolving. Um, these are very comparable kinds of situations that we have. Um, uh, the other question that this analysis provoked was a kind of broader citywide look at where development is happening, where we have room for it. Um, and if we took a big, big picture to us, uh, made it clear that uh, uh, we could be patient, uh, if you will. Uh, there was 20 million square feet of permitted area in South Boston nearby, all kinds of development all over the city. Um, there was room for growth in the city, and I, I think this justified a fairly conservative position with regard to protecting this new open space asset. Um, and finally, the sort of urban form and the final recommendations, uh, uh, which grew out of this, uh, were delivered at sort of multiple levels. And this is a, an example of the final document that many of you have seen, uh, and I'll walk you through a little bit just how it works. Um, in red are what we call dimensional criteria, the sort of slightly firmer um, criteria where we give either specific building heights or we request certain kinds of relationships to uh, the existing context. In yellow, uh, programmatic goals that we describe for each district in terms of uh, activating frontage, creating certain kinds of relationships. And finally, in blue, um, <clears throat> perhaps, anticipating the sapphire necklace, um, important issues of connectivity. Um, these are, in a way, we're, we call them proto-zoning, they're guidelines, and they were meant to, in a sense, guide uh, future development and create, uh, if you will, a sort of a wish list um, that was a little bit a la carte um, based on a sort of incredibly changing complex environment. Um, we did these sort of unique guidelines, almost parcel by parcel, uh, for all of our districts. Um, and the Wharf District, uh, not surprisingly, is one of the biggest and perhaps maybe, maybe one of the most immediately kind of important. Um, I think that the, in summary, some of the takeaways dimensionally were establishing a sort of height limit that was comparable to Rose Wharf. Um, uh, enhancing a lot of the connectivity that was already there, particularly to the waterfront. Um, we are encouraging uh, also uh, building masses that um, have space between them that go up and down, uh, and of course activating all of these public areas uh, and preserving a lot of those already very successful public uses. Um, this is, we believe, a very strong kind of starting point for what we're doing. Um, I want to back up just for a second uh, to look in a little bit more detail on how we analyzed the waterfront district specifically and how we saw it. Um, we we joked that we call it the the, the waterfront chaz. Um, it's a it's a very special place in the city where an otherwise very solid, opaque kind of downtown uh, actually breaks apart. Um, so we're already working with a context that provides a lot of accessibility and visibility. Um, and it happens to be hanging off this fantastic open space. Um, zeroing in, there's a few kind of pressures that come to bear. Um, one is the connectivity back into that fabric um, and alignments between those openings um, and the city and the kind of preservation of views out. Um, these are all values, I think, and, and ideas that that we will be continuing to explore. 
um, and to revisit some of the analysis that led us to these conclusions. Um, uh, these are our sort of challenges and opportunities axons and where we, we identify some of the issues that are there. Um, in short, for the waterfront, um, and as Richard mentioned, the, the continuity of the Harbor Walk, the, the problem bridges create in terms of accessibility is a big one on the list. Um, some of the opportunities here obviously are strengthening some of the connections to the waterfront and to South Boston. Um, and finding a way to get the, the potential development in these areas to help with these issues. Um, again, along the, along the further north here, a lot of in, inactive edges that resulted from the elevated highway, some of which are slowly being activated, but many of which still persist. Um, <clears throat> And then again, some of the opportunities here, uh, which is strengthening some of these connections from the city to the water, Harbor Walk, um, et cetera. I think where we start now is to uh, carry forth this methodology, uh, but not so Greenway-centric now. I think we were really looking at all these issues from the point of view of the Greenway, and I think where we're looking at these issues now uh, is really from the waterfront. Um, and the, the issues become maybe more, more nuanced. Um, you know, what's an active edge on the waterfront when sometimes it's pretty active to just sit and watch what's going on in the water? Um, are you looking from the water to the water? Um, there is a very rich assemblage of buildings, wharves, uh, cultural uses, Etc. here that um, we'll need to really drill down. And I think this, this whole study represents a kind of final layer of sort of deep refinement, if you will. Um, these are just some of the points that we've identified. We should all get together on Friday at our workshop and talk about these some more. But there are obviously some inactive edges. There are problems with the connectivity of the Harbor Walk, um, some inactive spaces. And I'm sure everybody has their own list. Um, obviously, we're starting from a very strong place. There are enormous opportunities. Uh, this is one of the best, most active, most accessible, um, most publicly visited pieces of waterfront, certainly in the Northeast. Um, in terms of its cultural assets, uh, the mix of hotels, residential, um, we're really starting in a good place. Um, and I think part of our challenge is to figure out ways that uh, future development can make these things even better. Um, in terms of what we have, uh, Rich identified our study area. Um, we have all kinds of terrific accessibility, uh, a lot of waterfront accessibility. These are detailed maps that we'll have available for all of you to understand uh, in a little bit more detail where these connections are. You can see the Harbor Walk meandering around the edge. Um, some of the ferry services, um, water dependent uses, lots. Um, these are in addition to the ones that go to South Boston. Um, these are a terrific asset um, that we'll need to figure out how to capitalize even further. And obviously the, the open spaces. Um, the, for me, the most dramatic moment, of course, um, in Kairos' time lapse show was the, you know, it's all, of course the final slide, but just the, the pure amount of green in that, in that aerial is actually pretty extraordinary um, to think that over time the downtown of Boston, Massachusetts is getting more and more and more green. Um, we have a lot of it here. We'll have to figure out how to strengthen its relationship to the water. Um, and finally, yeah, connecting to the greenway. Um, how can we find even more ways um, to make these relationships simple and accessible? Um, and we'll be looking at program, uh, destinations, uses, uh, and as I mentioned, we're into a finer level of understanding here. We'll have to understand all the detailed programming. For instance, uh, many of you know there's a restaurant on the upper level of the, of the Marriott here. Um, is there a way to make that feel more accessible, or is there a way to capitalize on those things that are already there, have them contribute to the public realm and not be so concealed? Um, a quick 
snapshot of um, all the fantastic things we have. Um, many of you are familiar with all these things, but sometimes it's nice to see them all in one place. Um, and uh, another snapshot of many kinds of interesting ideas that we should think about. I think we should think big about uh, what are the other additional kinds of amenities we could bring? This is my favorite, is the barge pool. Um, the, the harbor's almost clean enough to swim in, but, you know, why, why risk it? <laughs> um, these are excellent examples from many cities, um, and, and not just, you know, beautiful warm cities, but cold places like Toronto, uh, Montreal, um, uh, New York, um, all kinds of excellent ideas here. Um, and as I said, we're starting in a rich place. We have, we have an aquarium, we have restaurants, we have hotels, we have all sorts of great things. Um, we could maybe do even better. Um, I'll close with a little reminder about our process over the next two days. We're doing some walking tours tomorrow, which I highly recommend, especially for people who I think they already know the waterfront. Um, when you walk around with a different mindset, you see a lot that you maybe have never noticed. Um, and then on Friday morning, um, we'll be having a kind of workshop charrette uh, with a number of different tables um, where we can actually get some of these ideas in place. Um, I encourage all of you to attend who can. Uh, I know many of you are residents, uh, many of you work in the neighborhood. Um, you are all experts, um, <coughs> those of you who come here every day, um, and it would be great to have your expertise. Um, so I think we'll, we'll just move on to questions now. So uh, before we get to, into uh, question and answers, um, and before any of you have to leave, I just want to remind you, uh, but when you came in, there were signing sheets, so give us all your details. Uh, your email list, uh, uh, your addresses, and other things. That way we can keep you up to date on what's happening. Um, also, also, as it relates to social media, uh, we're continuing to grow the VRA and to improve how we communicate and interact with the public. Um, if you have ideas about the waterfront or other ways to get them to us, um, share them on Twitter by tagging hashtag BOS Waterfront or hashtag Plan Boston. Our Twitter handle is at Boston Redevelop. Um, so different ways to reach out to us. Um, and we'll be sharing all these ideas you have um, with our team. Um, so just to let you know that and uh, to not to forget, uh, forget to sign in uh, before you leave. So uh, we have some microphones here that we'll pass out for people that have any uh, questions or comments for us. Hi, um, Jerry Warner from Rose Wall from the Wharf District Council. A terrific presentation, and it's very exciting as to how we're going to go ahead with this. One thing that wasn't touched on and that we have talked about when we've met before, and that is that as we see the development and, and see what is happening, is now in operation, we seem to be developing a problem that wasn't that we haven't mentioned here, and that is we have traffic gridlock, particularly in the afternoon. And I sort of have a feeling, as we looked at all of the circles all around the city, that it's time to find someone who can just uh, digest all of the tra traffic data for the whole city, because it seems as we now see, and we don't know why, this surge of traffic coming from the seaport, there was always parking there before, that comes in the afternoon, uh, garages that are let out, some of those things can be solved. I think in some cases it may be a development that is quite a distance away from us in another part of Boston, that we have this bubble that we're under, and that now things that we do as we develop even further and more densely those things that are further away may very well affect our enjoyment and the value of the very new things that we're creating. So I just hope that somewhere as we look at this, we will be mindful that there is this other element that we have to consider. 
There actually is a, a model, an updated model for transportation in South Boston, and, and we're conducting a needs assessment for the Northern Avenue Bridge Project to add those additional lanes. And what we can look at is adding the density, existing density, proposed density along the down front to, to, to put that into the model um, so that they correlate most of the people that are leaving yeah. South Boston are coming over the, the Moakley Bridge. So those are things that we can look into uh, as part of this process. Rich, uh, Bruce Berman from Save the Harbor, Save the Banks. Great to hear from Peter and from Kairos and from you and get a chance to meet Matthew. Just one quick comment. Um, you know, Matthew, I totally agree with you. The barge is the coolest thing. Um, but that's because our water's cold. There were 700 tests done in the past two years in South Boston, and seven of them failed. I teach at BU. That's a 99.2% success rate which is an A in my book. We have the cleanest urban harbor in the country. And I'd like you to join me on the 23rd for the Cupid Splash so that you can see just how cold it is and how great it would be to, to have a heated barge, but not because the water's not dirty. That said, you shouldn't go swimming in downtown because there's too much activity and it's not safe. We have great beaches. This is going to be an exciting process. Um, I would just ask one thing. I was in awe of the presentation. I'm often in awe of the visuals that you guys put together. Extraordinary plans and to see them like this is very helpful. If you could put them on a website so that we could all have access to them, I know that all of us are gonna be going home and wanna share this with our friends and our coworkers and the advocates that Judge Garrity helped create. I mean, it would make it really easy. So the sooner we have a website to go to and I'll talk to you about the splash later. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, actually, Bruce, could you pass the microphone down? Yes, it would be my pleasure. Yes. But do I have to decide? I'm giving it to you. <laughs> there will be a project website oh. where we'll have all, all these details. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sally Katz. I'm a resident uh, for 10 years. And I consider myself so lucky to be able to live here. And it's just getting better and better. And I think that that is something that hasn't been mentioned. I have to join in with the traffic. We also have pedestrian traffic. We are so attractive now that we, I just urge you to come on a summer weekend and see the pedestrian traffic that emanates from Long Wharf to both sides. And I, hope that this can be considered, and I, I'm sure you are doing that because you are doing such a good job, but just to keep in, uh, in uh, your mind the pedestrian traffic and how we can make that better. We have such density it's now, it's getting more and more. The day I was out, and it was a nice day, and the Northern Avenue group was so crowded, I couldn't believe it. It was like summer. So I just wanted to point that out to you. Thank you. Jane. I would stand up, but I'm having difficulty these days for a short period. Um, I'm Jane Forrestall. I live in the West End, and I was a, a part of the Long Wharf Harbor Plan, um, the Municipal Harbor Plan. Not Long Wharf, excuse me, Lovejoy Wharf. <laughs> and that was a long, difficult <coughs> project to work on, and I think that what we did was we got mired down in too much minutia. We put too many details in there. So I think when, unfortunately, I have to work on Friday and tomorrow, so I won't be able to do any of these tours. And I'm hoping that one of the charrettes could be on a Saturday morning um, or in the evening, perhaps, so that um, uh, those of us who are working can come to some one of those. But it's um, just being part of this process. We did a charrette when we were first looking at the West End in general um, about 15, 10, 15 years ago. And it came up with ideas, and we were looking at perhaps doing a plan. But there are so many different things that need to be done. And there's so much detail. It's such a wonderful opportunity. But just don't put too much detail into it. Otherwise, 
in future generations, they're going to be coming back doing this exact same thing, saying, why did they put this in? So just I just want to urge you all to think openly and not think so closed and to that one small area. Hi, uh, my name is Ford Cavallari. I'm with the Friends of Christopher Columbus Park. Um, I actually have two questions that are not related, so I can ask them both together, or I can ask one, wait, and then ask the other. Your choice. Both. Okay. The first question is: um, the, the both questions are uh, have to do with dimensions that I didn't see in the pretty impressive methodology that you guys uh, put forth. Um, one of the reasons that Sydney Harbor is a great harbor is because they didn't build a, a mass port warehouse on the other side of the harbor. And one of the things that I didn't see in any of the pictures was the reverse view looking out. And that's particularly a concern since they're doing pile driving in East Boston. And I'm wondering to what extent the process that you have put together is looking at both sides of the harbor. Because I think, you know, if one side's beautiful, and the other side is, let's say, not in balance, you might not get the result that you like. Um, and the second question has to do with um, sort of the, the behavioral aspect that I didn't see in the plan. Um, uh, we were reminded at a NURA meeting in the North End recently by members of the Boston Police Department that um, the density of liquor licenses affects a lot of, let's call them behavioral aspects of the community and problems that ensue. And I'm curious if, in your methodology, you're looking at um, behavioral change elements that might be something that we want to think about, like the density of liquor licenses. And I'll point out, for instance, in the North End, we have, uh, I think, the highest density of liquor licenses per capita and per area in, in Boston. Thank you. So, so your first question, um, thankfully, East Boston is in Boston and under the city's planning review. So the new developments that are under construction there have gone through the same level, level of review that we intend to do for the downtown waterfront. So we think about that. We think about what people are going to see from different uh, view sheds of the city. So that is kept in mind. Um, as it relates to your second question, we are going to look at uses. We're going to look at how to activate the waterfront and the mix of uses. So you know, <coughs> what type of ground floor uses, what type of retail, restaurants, those type of establishments. We'll get into that level of detail, but not into the, I think, the social issue level that, that you've brought up. Um, you know, we probably can make recommendations of, you know, the balance of uses um, and, and begin that discussion. Thanks. Hi there. Uh, great, pres great presentation. Uh, resident and business owner, Neil Denberg. Just wondering about the parking lot that is owned by the city uh, next to the pilot house, uh, what the plans are for that particular parcel. Sergeant Swarf, um, there are no plans to redevelop that site at this time. Makes money. Great. Mm -hmm. Makes money. <laughs> <laughs> no plans. Just an abstract yeah. thought. Have you ever considered minibuses, perhaps at the weekend, on the waterfront, as they do on Nantucket? I mean, I know the scope is larger here, but as you want people to walk and lose weight, and that you could keep the cars out of a certain area in the downtown here. I just wondered if you'd ever considered that. Uh, we haven't, but we are going to look at transportation um, access in, into this area, and now we're focusing on water transportation in particular. Dave Kubiak, North End Waterfront Residents Association, otherwise known as NURA. Uh, I'm disappointed this evening. I, as I was disappointed with the Greenway District Planning Study as well, because as you showed with uh, one of your slides, the Greenway District Planning Study involved 
very, very little bit of the entire Greenway district, a very small square foot area of the entire district was dealt with with recommendations, and they were all related to development and commercial activity. And I'm afraid that most of this uh, presentation tonight also focused on development and commercial activity. And I, I put an exclamation point after the comment by the gentleman from the Wharf District about transportation because the traffic is horrendous along the Greenway, especially as you get closer to, uh, to the North End, but maybe I'm biased on that. Uh, also, I didn't hear much about open space or reconfiguring open space. Uh, I think we have a lot of open space problems <coughs> along the, wa the uh, downtown waterfront area, and I think it's going to take some courageous decisions to reconfigure that space so that it works a lot better than it, than it does. Uh, so I, I don't even want to participate in this if it's only going to look at a very small fraction of the area along the waterfront district, and if it's only going to be about development and commercial activity. I wonder, this is Bud Rest from the Aquarium. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what's going to happen after March 15th. Um, in terms of the process, I'm, I'm sure your consultants outlined various phases of this study and how it's going to unfold and how people can participate, you know, beyond checking out things on the website and so forth. So we're going to have our, our, our walking tours tomorrow, our workshop on, um, on Friday. Uh, we intend to form a Municipal Harbor Planning Advisory Committee um, shortly, we hope that group will be meeting every month to review uh, the evolution of this planning process. Those meetings will be open to the public. We'll make sure you get noticed through your contact information. Um, and, you know, we're not sure how long this planning effort will take. Um, our plans can take six months. They can take up to two years. It will take as long as it does to, to make this a good plan. Um, as it relates to the zoning analysis, um, our consultants are going to be advise, advising us on different approaches and we will go back to the community uh, community meetings to, to kind of go over those options um, and that will be concurrent with the municipal harbor planning process. But uh, we, we intend to kick off the harbor planning committee in those meetings um, in mid-April. Um, I'm Eunice Buckland from Harbor Towers, and I had a question. Um, have you looked at the um, change in age demographics? Uh, which age group is moving in more to um, this affected area? Is it more in young families? Is it older seniors that are retired? Um, is it young professionals? And I'm just wondering whether that you factor that into the planning. I mean, I'm concerned, for instance, I think you mentioned the fact that you're thinking of um, adding um, car accessibility to the North Avenue Bridge, the walking bridge. And um, I know that a, a huge number of uh, people in my age bracket and um, older senior citizens, uh, walking is a major activity. Um, and I'm concerned about taking away something that is safe for them to use um, and, um, you know, uh, bringing cars onto that uh, bridge. And so I'm just wondering about the age demographics and what the trend is. I don't have the numbers with me uh, for uh, right around the harbor, I can give you general numbers. We're the youngest adult city in America. One out of three people in the city is in the age group 20 to 34. And 30% 30 of those people own their home. 10% are in dormitories. And if you look at, for example, Millennium, they're selling their place right across from Paramount Theater. Uh, it's about 50% sold at this point, and about a third of those being sold to young people. Um, you know, there are empty nesters. Uh, I suppose somebody, one of my children, told me I was a post-empty nester. Uh, I'm so old. 
there, there, but you know, there's there's a, a mix in, in the city. I, I want to because yours is the third or fourth question on transportation. Uh, the mayor, I think about eight months ago, said the car is no longer king in Boston. Now the car is not our enemy, but it's certainly not our friend. And I think too many cities have surrendered in the in the last century surrendered themselves and their planning to cars. And part of the question. Uh, if, if from the beginning, uh, you know, Kairos, when you, you asked your question, Kairos said, you know, we've got to get people out of cars. A and, it, you know, generally when you do that, a lot of people say, yeah, you've got to get those other people out of cars. Um, but, you know, we have, we, we are doing a lot of work as we look in future developments about where there are no parking spaces. Uh, and, and so that you, you, you go beyond encouraging, you, you, you create a situation where people have to use public transportation. By the way, those young people, um, in a little bit, half of them will be either walking, bicycling, or taking public transportation to work. And we as a community, and certainly the BRA, needs to do as much as we can to encourage that. Uh, and, and frankly, the state has to do more than it does on public transportation and making sure that we're funding public transportation. And that's a battle going on um, in the state right now. One of the things about our city, our every workday, our city population doubles. And so when you look at issues like the extension of the Green Line to Somerville, you know, just as an example, that's as important to Somerville as it is to us. And, and if you look at where people come from, uh, and, and with the public transportation used to get into the city, we need to, you know, for all of us who live in the city and, and, and can walk to a lot of places we go to, we need to be advocates for the public transportation into and out of the city so that our friends who come here and work here get in and out of the city in public transportation with ease. So it's a, it's a complex and difficult assignment, and it's acute in the area we're talking about. We hear that. Mentioned the climate change. Uh, I didn't see any sketch of what area would be covered by that, and what exactly was going to be covered in terms of seawalls or raising levels of buildings in the future, or how you were doing that. Uh, we're going to look at in the entire planning area, but we really can't just isolate it when we start looking at you know other permanent barriers. Um, we're really just discussing this are beginning this discussion um, by understanding where the areas are at risk and then what the city can do to protect those areas. And the first thing is just common kind of engineering practices to locate your um, building mechanicals and upper floors um, for your ground floor uses to make sure they can withstand uh, flooding, uh, to make sure that when there is high water that your building can function through the flood and after the flood. What we've seen in New York, a lot of these newer buildings are, are probably going to be taken down because they've been wiped out, their mechanicals have been wiped out. So we're really not looking at this time at, you know, what's the, the large you know, project to protect the city, but really making sure that we know where there will be flooding and that the type of construction that we're allowing in the future um, can withstand, withstand that type of flooding. Thank you. The previous study that was done, uh, which you referred to, uh, where guidelines were established, what I'm wondering about is, is now that you're looking more comprehensively, not, not just at the edges, but you're looking at the whole waterfront, whether you're just going to codify what was done at that time, or whether you're going to, in fact, even evaluate some of the guidelines that were done at that time. I realize that the same consultants who were very fine consultants, I, I, 
I know them well, UTL, uh, and certainly the BRA is tremendously talented, and that was a very great study. But I'm wondering whether, in fact, it's just going to codify that, or whether you're going to do some evaluation now that you're doing a more comprehensive view of the waterfront and its edges. For the um, development areas along the water's edge, subject to Chapter 91, there's another level of analysis that we have to do. Um, the shadow impacts in our harbor plans for Chapter 91, we actually look at October 23rd, as late into the season as possible where people can enjoy being outdoors for extended periods of time. Um, so we would analyze it you know, in more detail for that level. Another thing that we didn't take into consideration in the Greenway guidelines was that the Chapter 91, the state's um, program requires that 50% of the lot has to be open space. Um, you know, do we want to require that for these projects or will we consider less space for benefits elsewhere? So I think we're starting what's in the guidelines now but analyzing them even further, but still our objective is to protect and promote the Greenway. That's still still the objective of the planning process. Any other questions? I think that's unfortunate because a municipal harbor plan really should connect the city to the water. There was very little said tonight about what's happening on the water. What should be the uses along the water? And how do we support those uses, best support those uses on land? Thanks. I have to urge you to please use the open space right here where we need it and not move it to other areas. I think every building that's going up should have 50% open space here where we need it and we're so proud of it. Any other questions? What if you have to limit it to number just one thing that you're most concerned about that you want us to be concerned about? What would that be? I don't think we want you to be concerned. <laughs> I, I, I think we want you to see this as a, a great opportunity to build upon all the successes that have happened along the waterfront. Um, the cleanup of Boston Harbor, um, you know, was once a psychological barrier. Um, the barrier of the highway that's been removed, this great park system. You know, how do you use the park now? Have you ever been to the Harbor Islands? What would get you out to the Harbor Islands? Um, how do you use your open space? I, I think we're just looking for your input. It's your neighborhood. How do you use it now? How would you like to use it in the future? And you know, for the people that work here, visit here, and you know, what do you think their experience should be? So that's we're not looking. We're not looking for you to be concerned. Well, I'm concerned about the shadow. I mean, I for one think that the sun just brings out the best for the city residents and the tourists. Hi, I'm Andrew Ravito. I live in Island Towers. I was just curious, um, if you open up that Northern Avenue Bridge, I know you're probably going to build it so that people don't get run over, but what about the noise and the exhaust? Walking next to that with heavy traffic on it is not going to be nice. And I'm also wondering if noise is something that uh, you're paying any attention to, created by outdoor uh, music. You know, side of the cafes, these barges, what up? Um, for those of us who live here, it is nice to have the economic situation around us improved with businesses and stuff. But I think that really the quality of life for the people who live here, as the person, the two gentlemen from uh, the North End mentioned, about the uh, uh, liquor licenses. I think the noise goes hand in hand with that, and as well as the uh, fumes from cars and the noise from cars.
Um, I may be too much of a worrier, but all the uh, concerns expressed about the um, big, big tunnels and the walls and the lights falling down, et cetera. Uh, since this is glacial soil and fill-in, with the support of any construction, would that require extensive uh, deep piles to be sunk? And is there any danger of to the big dig? I know that any new developments would, would put in you know, deep piles, um, caissons and other things. And I don't know what the protocol is for um, mass DOT on developments adjacent to the um, the tunnel sections, uh, but uh, I assume that they would be reviewing the same uh, plans that we would be reviewing uh, to make sure there's no um, you know, compromise for the, the tunnels. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeanette Herman. I'm a resident of Beacon Hill. I, it seems to me that the original work that was done um, did not include, for the Greenway Planning District, didn't include the government center garage site, uh, the four-legged stool work, which seems very interesting. Um, the uh, district that was in, seemed to be envisioned at that time didn't seem to include the government center garage site. And I assume that in the new, uh, what was actually adopted by the plan, in the planning initiative, that that does include the Greenway planning, the uh, government center site. Um, I assume that that would completely change the assumptions about the number of people who would be added to the district. Would you be planning to redo all that work to reflect such a large development? It's a very careful observation. Um, the, the district runs through, um, it's a question of where the streets lie. So I think the district ended on Congress Street. So it sort of bisected the garage uh, in anticipation of a future development that would probably occupy both sides of that street. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, any development that might occur there uh, and its impacts on the Greenway would certainly be encompassed um, by the study. I don't think there was some specific exclusion um, on the northern side of Congress, um, if that answers your question. I, I, it seems to me that the district was defined differently for your study and for what actually came out later with the Greenway Planning District. Maybe someone from the DRA can address whether that, whether, whether the uh, outline of the district changed there. Well, it's, it's, to be honest, it's probably one of the areas of the map that's a little fuzzy, and we'll certainly be sharpening the, the, the boundaries. Um, we did study the entire site. As part of our study, um, you may be seeing some maps where the where the line is drawn right through the middle of it. Um, with regard to the, um, uh, the quantities of people uh, and their impacts, I think we did include. <coughs> And right now, this project is on hold. It hasn't been reintroduced. There have been some preliminary discussions, but it hasn't been brought back out. So we really, at this point in time, don't know what's going to be there. We have some thoughts that the developer has shown us, but we really have not seen any plan as yet. And he, from what I understand, um, the developer is planning to start doing something again soon. several years ago that have been withdrawn, so there are no projects filed um, with the BRA for the Harbor Garage. Harbor look like. 
Uh, one of the things that, uh, that folks in the North End have noticed is that as the South uh, Boston waterfront developed, the buildings are much more highly illuminated uh, than uh, the conventional buildings from the previous decades. And um, I'm, you know, I, I wanted to ask uh, what the BRA is thinking about regarding the illumination of buildings and also the whole issue of, of light pollution, which I think is important for the harbor. Um, they're the one uh, park that's been built, a very nice park on the East Boston side, in the evening has bizarre lighting that actually is like a bunch of car headlights facing the north end. So someone didn't sort of think that through, and I want to make sure that that's on your agenda for the planning. I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the lights at Pierce Park, right? Um, or, uh, yes. Yeah, it looks like there are a bunch of cars parked with the headlights facing, like a drive-in with all the headlights facing the north end. Sort of. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, uh, you know, as we are reviewing developments, um, we look, also look at you know, the views from different neighborhoods at the architecture. We, we do study light, um, and the goals of the city is to reduce light pollution, but also energy consumption into buildings. There's a lights out policy for the city that encourages developments to turn their lights off after the business day. Someone hasn't told the folks on the South Boston Waterfront. Well, most of those are under construction and they're working 24 hours a day, so okay. that might be what you're seeing. No, but I mean, I'm talking about sort of the, the uh, LED uh, um, uh, attributes of buildings. Okay. The, uh, the Renaissance Hotel has illumination. Uh, the ICA has a permanent illuminated part. There's a building that's uh, close to uh, Russia Wharf that is uh, that has a, a whole cap that's illuminated all night. It looks like a, a sort of a drop ceiling uh, looked at from the side. So just there's a lot of stuff that's lit up. And you know some of it's pretty and some of it isn't. But I don't know to what extent it's being thought of or controlled. We'll follow up on that. All right. Um, wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that we're walking for a starting tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Thank you.